Okay, all right. Well, good afternoon and welcome REMAX brokers to this exclusive class offered by um, your team here at WFG. Um, we're excited to bring this class to you. I want to introduce our speakers today, Aaron Stell. He's our Vice President of Marketing and Technology and our very own Matt Sandler. He's our legal counsel here in Oregon. And in today's class, we'll be discussing what cryptocurrency is and how it can be a part of the real estate transaction. After the class today, you should receive your credit certificate via email within the next couple of days. So just watch for that. And then lastly, if you have not had the opportunity to work with WFT, we would love for you to give us a try. Just reach out to your WFT rep and we will go ahead and get you get help to you. Thanks so much. And go ahead, guys. Thank you. All righty. Well, we'll go ahead and get started here. Thank you so much, Tammy. All right. So a couple of things real quick, um, especially since we have our, our good old attorney here on the line. Uh, um, one thing I wanted to make sure that we touched on is the fact that, you know, this isn't necessarily a, it's not a class about investments or investing. Uh, what we want to do is give you as much information as possible and then really allow you guys to make number one, informed decisions. Uh, and number two, have more educated conversations when your clients do bring this stuff up. Um, now, before we dive right into the class, I did want to touch on one thing real quick. Um, and one of the things that we've been trying to do here at WFG is for our great clients, because we know we have so many of you out there, is we're trying to give you guys a leg up on the competition uh, when it comes to uh, getting out in front of your clients, having timely conversations with them, and one of the ways that we are doing that is we're creating what's called the WFG Client Advantage. And what this looks like is what you're seeing on the screen right now is we are going to create a curated marketing piece that is timely to the market and is directed at certain clients uh, in order to get them to take action. So for example, we are going to be having another one come up here uh, at the beginning of the month. So what is that, tomorrow? Um, and with that, we will be touching on rates and inflation and some of the things that are really important in the market right now. And what's involved with this is we're going to have what's considered swipe and steal content. So what you're seeing there on the top left is it's something that can be used as a letter, as an email, as a script for a video, you know, really however you would like that to be set up. Then we're also going to have alternatives where you can send quick text messages to your clients and even give you examples of things that you can post on social. And each one has a very specific goal um, in mind. And it's a way, once again, to stay in touch with your database and to get clients that will maybe move from kind of on the fence into actively wanting to buy or sell. Uh, so you'd like, if you would like to see this, um, just talk to your WFG sales rep. Um, they can tell you all about the program, show you the pieces that have already been developed, and then show you what's coming up next. All right, so let's get into this whole cryptocurrency thing. So the first thing I want to do is I want to make sure that we kind of go through and set the foundation for what cryptocurrency is, um, how it actually is kind of applied in the real world, and then we'll dive into how it specifically relates to housing and in the real estate market. So the first thing I want to look at is, okay, if we just look at the very simplest definition of what cryptocurrency is, it's a digital currency, which transactions are verified through records maintained by a decentralized system using cryptography rather than by a centralized authority. Okay, I read that out there, and it's a whole bunch of words that oftentimes don't really make sense. So I want to walk kind of piece by piece through this and explain what that really means. So I don't expect you to know what that means right now. So, you know, one thing to understand is, you know, in the current world where everything is done via, you know, wire transfers, credit cards, uh, you know, you get your paychecks and they're sent in, you know, via, via some sort of an electronic transfer, basically we're living in a digital currency world anyway. And the way that that looks is what you have over there on the left side, where the bank has their ledger, and you guys get this in the form of a statement every single month. And it'll say, all right, here are all the people that put money into your account. And so that can be your paychecks, that can be your commission statements, that can be, you know, Venmo transfers, whatever that may be. And then here are all the people or all the ways that you took money out of your account. And that can be, you know, your car payment, your credit card payment, your house payment, whatever those things are. 
But basically the bank controls that entire ledger. So you can go to the bank and see a rundown of every single piece of financial information because everything goes in and out of that one centralized place. The difference with cryptocurrency in the way that this works and in the whole term decentralized is instead of having one place where everything is tracked inside and out or going in and going out, you have a whole bunch of computers and that's what you're seeing over here on the right that are all creating a ledger balance or they're creating a ledger entry stating, yep, this particular thing took place. So for example, I sent Matt $200. I'm just gonna use this as a very, very broad general uh, kind of statement. I sent him $200 and all of these different computers all update their ledgers and say, yep, you did do that. We can see that you had $200 based on your previous transactions. And we can see that it's now moved into his account and it's identified as Matt's money for $200. Now, in order for that to work, you need a whole bunch of computers that are all going through and computing and saying like, yep, we all agree that this transaction happened. We all agree that this is the date and time and the amount and all of those good things. And so that's where we get into what's called the term crypto mining. And so, you know, when you first thought about, or we first talked about, you know, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, you, you kind of had this idea of, you know, the guy with his computer down in his basement and he, he's sitting there mining for Bitcoins is kind of what everybody talked about. Well, what it looks like today is more like this, just rooms and rooms and rooms of servers that are considered server farms where they are basically validating all of these different types of transactions. And I want to keep this kind of simple. And the thing is, is what they're doing with all of these transactions is they're creating multiple points that all verify something. And so that's what the whole decentralization part is for. And so if somebody's going to set up an entire server farm to get Bitcoin or to, to go through and verify all these transactions, they're going to need some sort of compensation for it. And so while they're going through and, and doing these decentralized registries, they're getting paid in what's considered crypto, cryptocurrency or coins. So basically what this does is it says, okay, if you continue to run all these transactions through your computer, we are going to reward you with a Bitcoin, for example. And so there's all these different types. And we're going to kind of run through what those look like. But if we're, if we're looking at kind of the main purpose of cryptocurrency, is it's to go through and make sure that you have multiple points of entry where we can, and I'm not gonna dive into what the blockchain means either, but basically where you have this, this whole um, decentralized blockchain where somebody tries to change it or they you know, say the blockchain gets broken because hackers got in there and tried to do something. You have all these other points to register back to and say, nope, that's not a valid transaction. All of these other ones are date and time stamped and it now validates whatever the latest transaction is. So I know this is, a, this is kind of complicated, but it, it will get a little simpler, I promise. So after you have all these computers that run all of these transactions and, and follow the money and everything else, they will get these coins and they have to figure out what are they going to do with them? And since it's a digital wallet, it's not like you're going to have cash or an actual coin that you can hold in your hand or you can put in your wallet or anything like that. But using the same terms, you are going to get a cryptocurrency wallet. And each coin has its own wallet. So you're not going to put like ones and fives and tens all together. You're going to put your Bitcoin in one place, your Ethereum in a different place, you know, depending on which coins you have they're all going to get this really long address. So I always like to put in there this, this is the world's first Bitcoin address. And so this gives you kind of an example of how like complicated these things are. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's capitals, it's lowercase, it's numbers, it's letters. So you're not going to just remember this one. This is not something where off the top of your head, you're gonna rattle off the, uh, the Bitcoin address or your Bitcoin wallet address. So you're going to need somewhere to put this. And, and the nice thing is, so back in the day, and I'll, I'll just kind of tell a, lot, a couple of horror stories that I'm sure you guys have heard, is you actually had to keep these on your actual computer. And so there were people that literally would have, you know, 10, 15, 20 Bitcoin sitting in their wallet on their computer. They take off for the weekend, mom, dad, brother, sister, whatever is like, oh, we don't need this computer anymore. They throw in the dump. That money's gone. Like there is no way to access that hard drive with those Bitcoin on it. So it's literally just gone. It'd be like if they took your wallet, threw it in the trash, it went in the truck and it's now dumped in the landfill. So it's literally gone. The good news is now 
most of this stuff's all kept online. So you don't need to do that anymore. You, you keep it at the exchange where you purchase it. And I'll jump into that in a second. But just know it's going to be this complicated set of numbers and letters that make sure that your wallet is your wallet. Nobody else can get in there. And without your permission, you're not going to send that money anywhere either. So it's meant to be the secure place to hold your coins. So, you know, the question we get a lot is how many currencies are actually out there? You know, almost everyone at this point in time has heard of Bitcoin. But now there are over 18,000 different cryptocurrencies out there in the market that people are either that are in, launched, trying to launch or working on right now. And so, you know, the, the question I always had, and this is prior to doing a, a lot of research and playing around with this, is why do we need so many? Well, there's, there's different reasons for the different type of cryptocurrencies out there. So on the top left there, you see the Bitcoin symbol. So Bitcoin, when it came out, and its entire goal is to be a digital currency and a digital currency only. So think of it as like, you know, just like you can get a Canadian dollar, a US dollar, um, you know, go into the euro or the pound, whatever those may be. Bitcoin is just another form of currency or money. Ethereum, on the other hand, which is the one there on the, the bottom left, it's actually made to be something that is going to be tied to what's called smart contracts. And, I, and that's another kind of more complicated thing that Matt's gonna dive into. But really what that does is let, let's say that, that Matt and I get into a contract where I'm going to sell him something and he offers to pay me a certain amount of money. Well, we can take that contract, upload it into, it's in basically using Ethereum, upload it into this thing. And it can figure out like, all right, Number one, do I now have ownership of this thing? Number two, did Matt send over the required amount of funds or coins in order to come up with his deliverable? And then it will keep a record inside of the, uh, inside of the blockchain saying that, yep, I now own this new little piece of, of whatever it is, this new piece of art. Matt has paid me that money. So now I have full rights to it. And that is now validated all throughout the blockchain. Now, then you get into some other ones where like request is the little R and I wanted to just kind of put that one up there, that one's basically sending peer-to-peer -peer money. So think of like Venmo or PayPal or something like that. All this coin is doing is just validating that once I send the money and the other person receives it, we're all on the same page. They know it's, it's, it's backed up in multiple places that they've received the money. It's backed up in multiple places that I sent the money. So we're all square. Then you get into some weird ones where this Cheddar one, I, I just heard about this a, a few weeks back or maybe a month or two back. And what their whole goal is, is they're trying to make what's called a social token. So what they want to do is they want to create these coins where you can now use them to buy beer. You can go to concerts, you can see movies, you can do all of these activities and even go to these specific kind of parties or meetups. And so, so the reason I bring that up is not to tell you to get on board with any specific one, but just to know there's a lot of reasons that people are starting to create these far beyond just trying to make money off of them. So there is some, uh, some other stuff um, that's kind of behind the scenes working. All right, so if you want to pick these up, where do you get them? And, and this is the, the other question. If you want to get you know, involved in you know, trading crypto in one way, shape, or form, traditionally, you're going to have to go to an exchange. And so Coinbase is the biggest one in the world. That's the one that most people go up to. It can be an app on your phone. You can go sign up online. You know, it's web-based. Crypto.com is doing a heavy, heavy marketing push right now, uh, including sponsoring the stadium in Los Angeles, which I'm sure cost a pretty penny. Um, and then you get things like Robinhood, which they really jumped into the market where they wanted to be trading, you know, stocks, bonds, you know, things like that. They wanted to be a true kind of, you know, S&P 500 trader. But then they started seeing that both their clients and large funds had a desire to mix crypto into their portfolios. So they started bringing in cryptocurrency into their stuff too. So the nice thing about say like a Robinhood is, you know, you can have a, a share of Google stock right next to a Bitcoin versus like Coinbase, they pretty much stick to just coins. Now Uniswap, I put that one in there as Uniswap's a, a little bit different, but what they do is they basically allow you to get all the obscure stuff. So if you you're trying to say buy whatever on the last one, a request or a Cheddar token or one of those ones that's not a, a mainstay right now. You can basically go out and buy Ethereum, use Uniswap to trade that for this other coin. So that's what a lot of the people on the forefront are doing. It's a little more complicated. Traditionally, what you're buying there is a little more risky. 
And then every time you buy one of these coins, then some miner out there, remember I talked about mining a little bit earlier, is taking a little fee in order for you to move the coins from one place to another. So there's basically almost like a tax. Um, they even call it gas. Um, but it's like a little tax that they take every time you move these coins from one wallet to the other because they want to make sure that whoever is basically updating these ledgers gets some sort of payment. All right, so why does it even matter? Like, why are we even talking about crypto right now? You know, clearly, you know, this was something that over the last two years got a ton of press. There was a lot of buzz around it. And, you know, some of it's going to be what I think would be sustainable. Um, and some of it's stuff that was just like people didn't understand and they were, they had some money and they were bored and they wanted to do some investing. So they decided to buy crypto. But if you really look at kind of where it's going, you know, there are a ton of companies that are now diving in and saying, we will accept cryptocurrency. And we're not talking about little obscure tech companies. You know, if you go through this, one of my favorite ones, Matt and I were talking about this earlier, is Subway. You can literally use Bitcoin to buy a sub sandwich. You know, you can pay your AT&T bill. You can buy Microsoft products. You can use it on PayPal. I mean, there's all of these large companies that are now accepting Bitcoin. Um, you know, it's funny, Tesla originally was accepting it, and I forgot they had actually quit accepting Bitcoin because it takes a ton of electricity and resources. So until they get up to 50% green energy, they're not going to take Bitcoin in anymore. Um, but that's just a little side tangent. But you can see all of these major, major companies that are already accepting this. The other side of that is there's a lot of people that are starting to actually take this on as this is how I want to get paid. You know, and, and I put in just a, a handful of kind of the bigger ones, um, but the Miami mayor is actually getting paid in crypto right now. He doesn't want dollar bills. He wants Bitcoin. Um, you know, Deal is a, is a company that they're now putting it into their, their options for people that want to get hired. There are several NFL players. Um, I put in Odell Beckham because this, uh, this is kind of a recent one, but there are quite a few NFL players that are willing to take their salary in, um, in Bitcoin. And there's actually financial advisors right now that are encouraging people to hedge um, basically inflation by putting their money into Bitcoin. So that's why I say, you know, don't worry about cash. Take all of your money in Bitcoin. That will continue to go up. Once again, this is speculation. So don't, don't go through and cash all your money in for Bitcoin. But, but there's a lot of experts that are out there saying like, yeah, don't, don't get paid in cash. We don't need U.S. dollars. Go get paid in Bitcoin. Point and you'll be able to use that to purchase things on the go forward. So, you know, as we look at all this and you look at the different ways, you know, that people, number one, acquire Bitcoin, number two, keep Bitcoin. And then as it, as the prices fluctuate, you know, how does it affect real estate? And so if we look at it um, and, and you look at this, here's a chart that I actually just pulled today because I wanted a new one. You know, each coin out there is going to have some form of U.S. dollar price. So, for example, Bitcoin today is, is trading right around $46,600. And the way that this works is much like stocks and bonds. It's going to be a situation where it is, all right, how many of these coins do we have? So it's a supply situation versus how many people are trying to buy them. So supply and demand, just like stocks. So if you notice like the, the U.S. dollar coin or the USDC there, there are almost 52 million or 51 and a half million coin or yeah, billion coins in circulation. Meanwhile, there's only not even 19 million coins for Bitcoin. And so as more people buy those, like Bitcoin was intentionally made to be scarce. There's not supposed to be that many of them. That's why the price goes so high. And some of these other ones where you literally have, you know, 80 billion of them, they're meant to be fat, fairly rob or, uh, robust and, and out there. So they're not going to be so expensive on a per coin basis, um, but they will, you'll be able to hold a lot more of them. So, so basically what you're going to do when we're talking about coins is, um, you know, if you're, if you talk to your bank, they're going to be treated just like some other like stock mutual fund bond portfolio item. So what we're going to have to do with this is you're going to have to sell it at this point in time and turn it into cash. And more important than that, you are going to have to show where it came from, how long you had it. You'll probably have to show some statements. So just like if you cash out, let's say $100,000 out of your 401k, you know, when you go to get underwritten, 
you're going to need to show where that came from. The bank's going to want to know that you didn't just suddenly get $100,000 in your bank account with no ties or ways to show where you got it. So it's not just, you know, free money that's kind of, you know, string free. Um, it does have to have a tail and you are going to have to validate all that. So, you know, as we really get into kind of the nuances of this, this is where I'm really excited to bring in Matt because Matt can talk about, all right, you're going through and you're, you're selling some of your portfolio of coins. How do you actually turn that into real estate? How does law apply? And, and what do we do next? So I'm going to go ahead and stop this and turn it over to our, our in-house counsel, Matt Sandler. Awesome. Uh, that was a, a great uh, introduction and, and uh, history and description of, of crypto. I really appreciate that, that Aaron. So I, I want to kind of follow up where, where Aaron left off and give you a little bit more, I guess, intimate information as to how this actually plays out in the real estate world. And, and before I jumped in, I thought I would show you guys, I have actually a wallet here. Um, it's a, this is called a hard wallet, and this is where I store my crypto currency. And I wanted to show this to you guys because it's going to become important with our discussion and, and how um, it works in real estate. So this is what's called a, a cold wallet, which basically means a wallet that is not connected to the internet. And a hot wallet, as Aaron was describing earlier, is a wallet that's actually connected to, to the internet. And so if this is lost or you lose your key to this, as Aaron was mentioning, it's gone. You can't access the funds anymore and you've just lost however much money you've invested. And this becomes really, really important um, because depending upon how you store your cryptocurrency, the more risk, the more at risk it could be for some sort of attack or, or hack. And so I'm sure all of you have heard in the news recently that there's been reports of hackers kind of stealing um, portions of, of cryptocurrency from a various, various owners or what have you. And that typically happens because their wallets, their digital wallets are connected to the internet, therefore they're susceptible to, uh, to cyber attacks. So I just want to, wanted to kind of share that and, and differentiate the two types of, of wallets that we, that we currently have. Secondly, I also think it's really important because we're about to start talking about how this applies to real estate is also just um, compare, I, I suppose, the, the blockchain that Aaron was talking about earlier and our real property records. And so as Aaron was discussing with you, every time um, there's some sort of transaction with cryptocurrency, it gets uh, docketed into this ledger, so to speak, or on this blockchain. And this blockchain is essentially a dis, uh, decentralized ledger, as Aaron mentioned, that records information in what's called these digital blocks. And once a block is added to the chain, it can't be altered. And what's really, really important about this is that that blockchain or those entries into this ledger is public information. And so I like to analogize that to our real property records. So every time there's something happens against a particular property or an individual, we, re we typically record that information in the real property records in order for a third party to search what matters or issues are against a particular property. They could see a clear chain of history. And that's very, very similar to what they're doing on the blockchain. Everything's being recorded. Um, and, and that becomes public information. And that becomes a really, really important aspect of this as I, as I discuss um, issues that the IRS are currently seeing. So that also, I think, helps kind of understand um, how the blockchain and everything's to work. But so what are the issues? What are the issues right now with real estate? Well, as I mentioned, there are two, generally two ways to store cryptocurrency. We have these cold wallets that look like a USB that I you know, keep in a, in a closet somewhere in my house. And then there's these um, hot wallets that store the cryptocurrency in, um, you know, on your computer or, or on the internet in the cloud, so to speak. And so the questions that, that I get um, almost on a monthly basis, and it's not just me here in Oregon, but this is true with our employees across the country, is we're getting questions from investors that will say something along the lines of this. I have 10 Bitcoin. And I'm a buyer. I have 10 Bitcoin and I want to buy a piece of real property in Oregon. And they say, WFG, are you able to accommodate that transaction? And my first response is, well, can you tell me a little bit more exactly about the structure of your transaction? What exactly are you wanting to happen? 
because if Aaron, if as Aaron said, if they're simply wanting to sell their Bitcoin or their other form of cryptocurrency, Dogecoin, Ethereum, whatever, and convert it to US dollars, we of course can accept that those US dollars into our escrow and we proceed like any other transaction. No different, we can do that all the time, every day. The issue becomes if the buyer and the seller tell us that, no, I want, I do not want to cash out my Bitcoin. I want to transfer five Bitcoin or 10 Bitcoin for this million dollar property. Can you WFG hold the Bitcoin and then transfer the Bitcoin or whatever cryptocurrency to the seller and let that be the full consideration for the price. And then we would ensure the transaction and close the transaction, just swapping cryptocurrency for real estate. Can we do that? Unfortunately, as Aaron kind of precluded to, uh, is we can't at this moment. And there are a number of reasons for that. Number one, simply title and escrow companies don't have a wallet yet. So we don't have any means to actually hold on to those crypto currencies. We don't have a wallet. Do I think that's going to change sometime in the future? Absolutely. And I'm a big proponent of that. But the reason why there's some hesitation and some delay in adopting this is one, as Aaron mentioned, this is all relatively new. We're, we're experiencing kind of these issues for the first time. And this sort of industry is very much still in its infancy. And we're trying to see kind of what issues and, and how certain things play out. And so one of the issues is that our current laws haven't really caught up to this digital cryptocurrency or this form of virtual currency, because what our, what our state laws typically say or typically require of title companies is that US or is that currency has to be placed into a federally insured account and that escrow has to make sure before drawing or dispersing, dispersing any sort of funds outside of escrow those funds actually have to settle and become what is called good funds under the law. And what that essentially means is just that we actually have the funds in escrow. It, it's, it's tangible, it's there, it's not in route via wire. We're not waiting for the check to, um, to, to cure. We have the funds held in escrow. Well, that becomes really difficult to apply that to Bitcoin or any other form of cryptocurrency because again, the laws haven't cut up with that. So for example, do, would we have to take that Bitcoin or that cryptocurrency and put it into some sort of federally insured account? Well, one, there, I, to my knowledge, there's not any sort of federally insured account that's willing to insure these cryptocurrencies. And number two is we can't pay, as I'm sure all of you guys can appreciate, um, you know, through escrow, we make a number of payments to a number of parties. We pay real estate commissions out of these, these settled funds. We pay off property taxes. We pay off liens and encumbrances and deeds of trusts and other things of that nature. Well, if we only have cryptocurrency sitting in our escrow, how do we pay off the, the chase deed of trust that, that the seller has on the property? How do we pay Multnomah County the property taxes that they owe if all escrow has is cryptocurrency? And so you can start to see how this becomes somewhat difficult for escrow and title insurance companies to, to operate in this realm as of now. And so what, what, are, what is currently being suggested? Well, one kind of popular idea out there that I'm trying to, to advocate for, um, and I know some of others at WFGR as well, and we're working with um, local state legislatures, is what if we did a combination of funds? What if we had a Bitcoin wallet that WFG or another title insurance company would keep in a vault at one of their offices where we could store parties' cryptocurrencies? But in addition to having this wallet where we stored cryptocurrency, what if we did a mix? What if we also had an escrow account with cash? And that cash would be able to um, address the issues such as the prior monetary encumbrances, paying off the Chase deed of trust and paying off Multnomah County's um, property taxes, covering any judgments. All of that would be handled in a traditional escrow with cash. And then we would have this hybrid closing where we also had uh, the kind of the purchase funds for the property in, in a different escrow or in a different wallet actually holding that cryptocurrency. 
And then at closing, we would simply transfer the cryptocurrency from our wallet to the seller's wallet. We would disperse the funds that we had in cash to pay off all of, uh, all of the lien holders and what have you. And we would close the transaction that way. So this type of hybrid closing, I think, is, is starting to gain some popularity. But again, it's going to be, as you can imagine, um, larger companies, uh, especially insur insurance companies, are perhaps not the quickest to move in this type of realm. So it'll be interesting to see how quickly that sort of model is adopted. But I think the, the additional concern, again, is what do we do with the Bitcoin once we have it? How do we, how do we make sure that the person that's transferring the Bitcoin to us is actually the party to the transaction? How do we make sure that, um, that the value, which we're gonna talk about in a bit more minute as Aaron was, was sharing with you guys, cryptocurrencies can be very, very volatile. And so I want, I'm gonna pin that, we're gonna come back to that. But as a title insurance company, we want to make sure that the, the parties, that the party that's to get the funds actually gets the funds, that the parties to the escrow agreement that's transferring funds into our escrow or would be transferring cryptocurrency into our escrow um, would be actually the parties to our transaction. And when it happens all digitally and it's cryptocurrency, that could prove to be a little bit more difficult. Do I think it's a hurdle that we can't get over? Absolutely not. But that's part of the part of the current issue that we're that we're facing. So going back to the point with volatility, and uh, this becomes a really, really important point of stress between clients or between buyer and seller because just how much Bitcoin and other types of cryptocurrency fluctuates from uh, on a daily basis, but also from on an hourly basis. So for example, the issue that we often see and that we're trying to, to troubleshoot at the moment is, is the following. And I'm curious um, to hear your guys' feedback. You are welcome to use the chat and give us your thoughts. But here's the scenario that we're often faced with. Seller says, I'm willing to sell my property for five Bitcoin. Buyer says, I'm willing to purchase the property for five Bitcoin. And at the time that they reach this agreement, let's say that the five Bitcoin equals a million dollars. And so in US dollars, the transaction that's being contemplated is a purchase and sale for a million dollars for five Bitcoin. But what happens if between the time of entering that purchase and sale agreement and opening escrow, the value of that cryptocurrency or the value of that Bitcoin drops? And just for the sake of simplicity, let's say it drops 50% in value. And so now your five Bitcoin is now only worth $500,000. Is the seller responsible or still obligated to sell that property then to the buyer for that $500,000 or five Bitcoin? Who bears the risk for the market fluctuation in that cryptocurrency? And that becomes a really, really critical issue. I would love to hear your thoughts because again, this is all new. We're, we're trying to troubleshoot these issues now and and i would love to to hear your feedback one industry that we are looking at as kind of a as a roadmap to move forward is is the equities market and we often companies or investors often purchase and sell businesses or other companies for stock or other type of equity in a company or what have you and for example if you're buying a company in stock the stock valuation might fluctuate on a daily or an hourly basis, if the stock's trading on, um, you know, on a public exchange, we can watch those those values, and it it goes up and down on a very um, uh, on a very regular basis. And so the uh, I guess uh, I'll call them the nerds in these huge law firms um, across the world are drafting these really complicated contracts and coming up with these really complicated mathematical equations which probably are not being come up with by attorneys. They're probably some sort of financial math whizzes. Um, attorneys not to be, tend to not be the best at math, but they're trying to come up with these really complicated calculations to take into a, account these daily fluctuations and what happens once we get to closing. And so that is, that is something that's really, really important um, that we address moving forward. And one of the suggestions that actually a fellow um, 
that a fellow uh, real estate agent uh, shared with me is, well, what about just establishing the value at closing? So whatever the value of the crypto is at closing, that's what's to be attributed to, to the price or to the sale. And that sounds great in theory, but again, what happens if at closing that value drops 50% or 20% or what have you, and now the seller is arguably not getting the, the full consideration for, for, their, um, for their home. How do we address that? Again, curious to hear your thoughts. Similar to that is that has huge tax consequences for the seller. Are they selling the property for the 500,000 that the, the value of the, of the cryptocurrency is at the time of closing? Was it the value at the time that they entered into the purchase and sale agreement, which was a million? That could greatly affect the seller's capital gains on the particular property and what they have to pay, um, obviously, to the IRS um, in, that, in that tax period. So that becomes a, a, a huge issue. So that's, that's, that's one of the issues. The second is, or a, a number, or another issue that is being discussed is, is how this is viewed in the eyes of the IRS. And I actually had the opportunity to spend some time with attorneys for the IRS that are actually specializing in this arena and trying to get some sort of feedback as to what they're seeing and how they're handling it. And this is what they told me. Right now, the IRS is having a huge issue keeping track of all of these cryptocurrency type transactions, because as of right now, it's all self-reporting. In other words, if you sell your, your Bitcoin or your Dogecoin or what, what have you for a $20,000 gain, you are to report that on your, on your tax return in the upcoming um, tax year. Well, as you may or may not know, not everybody is, is following that, that self-reporting um, requirement that the IRS has put out. And so the IRS feels that they're missing a lot of opportunity to get this, um, to get a piece of the succession and wealth. And what's, what's really interesting, in, in my opinion, and what I tend to nerd out upon is that the IRS has told us that cryptocurrency for federal income tax purposes is to be treated as property and is going to be taxed very similar to real property. And what does that mean? That means that anytime that there's an exchange of crypto for another form of crypto or for real estate, that is a taxable transaction. I'm, I'm gonna say that again. Anytime cryptocurrency is exchanged, for another form of cryptocurrency or for any other form of property for that matter, that's a taxable event and has to be reported to the IRS. Again, as of right now, that's all self-reporting. And again, in the eyes of the IRS, they know for certain that everybody's not self-reporting appropriately. So they're, they're having this huge issue. Well, what do we do? Well, something that immediately popped into my mind was that what do we do as a title and escrow company when we close the sale of real estate? The IRS requires settlement agents, those that are involved in the closing of a real estate transaction, to report to the IRS that there was a sale of, of, of real property. And how do we report that? We report that via the 1099-S that you guys, I'm sure, are all familiar with. And what is the 1099S? It's really just notice to the IRS that, hey, there was a sale of this real property. Um, this was the sale price. This was the seller. This was the buyer. This is the date on which it happened. Um, and hey, IRS, you probably should be looking for a forthcoming tax return from the seller reporting that sale. And that kind of helps the IRS to, to, to track these taxable real estate transactions. And so what has been what is being kicked around in the IRS is that they actually might want title and escrow companies to start being involved in, the, in these transactions and place this, um, I say burden, but place this reporting requirement on title companies or escrow companies to actually report the exchange or sale of, of these cryptocurrencies because that of course would allow the IRS to better track what's, what's happening. 
And so, of course, we have really savvy investors and, and people that are very familiar with real estate and they, and they hear from the IRS, well, oh, we're treating these, these cryptocurrencies like property as opposed to just currency, as opposed to a US dollar. And so these savvy investors say, well, okay, if we're gonna treat it like property, can we 1031 exchange our cryptocurrency into real property? And the IRS has come back and said, no, I'm sorry, that fails on a number of, of different reasons or for a number of different reasons. And I'll, I'll share those with you relatively quickly. But ordinarily, when you sell something for more than what you paid for it, you have a capital gain. And um, when you sell something for less than what you purchased it for, you tend to have a capital loss. And both of those affect your taxes. But what the 1031 exchange does is it allows us to exchange real property for another and basically defer those capital gains to sometime in the future. And long story short is that's exactly what these real estate investors or crypto investors were wanting to do with real property. And basically the, the IRS has said no. Number one, cryptocurrency is considered personal property not real property. So it fails the like kind exchange requirement. So if you'll recall, if you do enter into a 1031 exchange, there ha it has to be a like kind um, property for property. In addition to that, back in December of 2017, which a, a law was passed or a, 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 the, it, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act was passed in 2017 and it took effect on January 1 of 2018. And it had a huge sweeping change to this 1031 tax law. And through the, through the Jobs Act, it basically said like kind exchanges can now only be done with real property. So, it, so the exchange for crypto for real estate failed on a number of bases. One, it's not like kind, it's real property and property. And two, we had the Jobs Act again that was passed in 2017 that did away with um, these kind of exchanges. And so the IRS, again, is trying to figure out ways in which to make sure that everybody is properly recording their, um, their, their sale. And so what I wanted to share with you is a little bit more about what the IRS is doing and why um, this is just so, so very important. So Aaron mentioned to you guys that one of the biggest um, crypto exchanges is, is Coinbase. And what you may or may not know is that this is that Coinbase is the largest crypto exchange in the United States, as, as Aaron mentioned, and it's the fourth largest in the world. And what happened recently is the IRS served a summons, what's called a John Doe summons on Coinbase, seeking information about, seeking information on almost all of their account holders. And specifically, the IRS was requesting information from Coinbase regarding accounts with at least $20,000 in any one transaction. And that's whether they were selling, sending it, or receiving it. And the, um, the report showed that this would affect more than 14,000 Coinbase account holders. And basically, what the IRS was trying to do is... I'm summoning Coinbase for this information because I want to comb through everything to see if these people are actually reporting these taxable transactions. I'm not going to go into all of the details of this case because I think it's kind of beyond the scope and, uh, of this class and we don't have, have the time, but um, Coinbase basically has initially refused, no, we're not going to comply with that, with that request. And so this lawsuit right now, I believe, is in the uh, U.S. District Court for Northern California. And we're going back and forth right now, or they're going back and forth right now as to um, the scope of the subpoena, whether or not the Coinbase actually has to provide that information, and um, what the IRS um, is to be privy to. And so we're all kind of watching this, this lawsuit with, with, with real interest to see how, see how it comes down because that very much affects the, the privacy and kind of the transparency of these types of transactions. What is really interesting though that I think people tend to forget is as I mentioned in the very beginning, as Aaron mentioned too, is that these blockchains or these ledgers 
are public information. And so what the IRS is able to do is they can look at an account that's associated with that, that public or private address that Aaron was mentioned, that's unique to every user. And the IRS can then see um, what IP address is associated with that account. So they can basically see who owns the computer or that internet or what have you that is using to actually log into these exchanges and, and make the, the purchase and sale of, or the exchange of these currencies. And they're basically kind of using deductive reasoning to, to look at these public ledgers, see the transactions, then go back to the accounts that are associated with those transactions, look at the IP addresses to finally get the individual associated with that account, and then serve them with either some sort of IRS penalty or a requirement to, to report those future transactions. And so that's something really, I think that's interesting. And again, it shows that we're still very much in the infancy um, of this industry as these kinks are starting to work out. Um, but in my opinion, it also, again, shows us the resemblance that this ledger or this blockchain has to our real property records because the IRS does the exact same thing in the public records. They're able to look in the real property records to see if a property was um, maybe transferred or sold within a very short time period, perhaps to avoid the payment of certain taxes. Or again, they can see whether a property was sold in the real public records to see if um, the, that sale was properly reported. So really interesting to watch that going forward to kind of, to kind of end this part of the, of, the, of the class and allow you guys to answer or ask some questions and, and give time for Aaron and I to answer them. Is, is kind of where are we going in the future and, and what is it gonna look like? So the interesting side to all of this is speaking with the IRS, they are putting a ton of time and energy and money into figuring out a regulatory scheme that applies to cryptocurrency. And the, what I took from that and what the, the attorneys told me is that, look, cryptocurrency, we have no idea what form or which coin or, you know, what's going to outlast them all, but they're pretty confident in stating that cryptocurrency or these virtual currencies are here to stay. They're going to be a part of our future and we need to start figuring it, figuring out how to properly deal with it. So that's kind of the, the long range, you know, I do think the industry is here to stay, but how does that apply to real estate and what's going to happen? Well, right now, as just a quick summary, again, as Aaron mentioned at the outset, if you have clients that are willing to sell their, any form of cryptocurrency and convert it to cash and then deposit that into an escrow account to move forward, beautiful. We can handle it like any other transaction. If they're wanting to keep the cryptocurrency in its, in its current form and exchange it for real estate, unfortunately, at this moment in time, Title and escrow companies just don't have the, the means to, to actually hold on to that cryptocurrency um, and, and accommodate that transfer. There are, uh, there are some digital escrow companies that I've noticed that are popping up that specifically deal with um, kind of escrowing these, these digital currencies. The problem though, is that these online companies from my understanding, they don't really have real humans behind them and, uh, and the customer service is lacking. And what if there's issues with the escrow or the transfer? It's just difficult to, to get a hold of people. And what they're also doing, as Aaron mentioned, and I, he said that I would touch upon it, so I will, is that this, this idea of smart contracts. And so oftentimes with these smart contracts, what they are really is just kind of this virtual contract that has certain contingencies that once those contingencies are met, the, they automatically operate to effectuate the, the end result or what have you. So if, if, for example, a simple contract said, um, I'm to pay Aaron um, five Bitcoin on, uh, on, the, you know, on, on the 5th of May, well, that can be written into a smart contract and the smart contract will be able to say, oh, it's the 5th of May, this, this condition has been met. 
we're automatically through the smart contract is going to go ahead and disperse that, that money to, to Aaron. And they're trying to do that without the involvement of actual live humans waiting for those conditions to be um, waiting to be met and told and, uh, and just do it automatically. So there's a lot of issues with that, um, as you might imagine. And, and similarly, just I think I'll, I'll leave you with this uh, kind of tidbit or this thought is that um, there are rumors going around that this blockchain type of technology and these smart contracts um, are actually going to replace the need for the real property record and for title insurance actually as a whole. And I have made the argument that um, the, the title company, uh, sorry, blockchain, it's, it's actually not sufficient to replace our industry because what, the, what the, the blockchain doesn't take into account, yes, the blockchain might be able to record or um, index or ledger all of the subsequent, all of the transactions between these parties, but what about the things that go unrecorded, for example, in the blockchain? What about, um, what about bankruptcy and divorces and civil litigation and child support and IRS liens and all of these issues that affect title to real property that doesn't necessarily get um, recorded exactly in the real property record, how would something like a blockchain, um, how would the blockchain account for all of that? And furthermore, let's say you did purchase a property through the blockchain without title insurance, people thought it wasn't needed and you purchased it prior to this um, prior IRS lien or this nuisance lien or some sort of utility violation or, or, what, or what happens. I guess you're stuck in that sense because that's something that we, the title insurance company, insure against. So if that happened to you, we would be the ones to pay that um, for that miss or for that defect if we didn't catch it. And you would not get that type of insurance product in the blockchain. So I personally feel that um, title companies are, are not one of those intermediaries that um, are going to face extinction as some, um, as some investors might believe um, with other intermediaries under other intermediaries in, in this sort of example. So I noticed a lot of um, things were coming through the chat and uh, we, I think, have only about five minutes left. So I thought um, we turn it over to, to you guys and see if we can address some of these, these questions. Yes, yeah, so we actually have uh, Dave Scriven actually, uh, he raised his hand. So I'm gonna go ahead, Dave, I will allow you to talk. Do you wanna ask your question? Sure, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yep. I'm using my, uh, uh, this is Dave Scriven. Uh, I think um, my question is in the chat. I absolutely don't get this. Uh, it sounds like crypto is volatile, fluctuates per market value, can, it's uh, values in per market conditions. And so how could this possibly work in real estate? It seems to me that uh, there'd be no reason for any party in a transaction, including the title company to gamble on values. That's another thing. I, obviously, real estate has some uh, volatility to it, but buyer and seller agree on a price, and then they have to have hard cash to to close. How, how could any how could any cryptocurrency ever work? I, I I just don't get it. Well, there's I can touch on one part of that, and um, and I'll let Matt jump in here in a second. So so to answer the first part of your question um, it is. And I was kind of going through the the chat and sort of seeing similar questions or statements from most people. And mm -hmm. most of what was stated in there was the fact that that people were still looking for uh, a U.S. dollar conversion. So they were wanting a sale price in U.S. dollars, and then wanting to. So if if it fluctuates drastically, either the buyer is going to have to come in with additional money, or the terms of the the contract are going to need to be changed. So. If, if you have it that way and you're just using it as an asset, then it's, you know, it can just be something where you're like riding the wave and you're hoping that, that it's kind of at a high when you have to sell and then, you know, you're, you're paying less out of pocket. The other side of that is there is a contingent and this is a real contingent that's growing that believes that crypto is going to become a bigger part of kind of our, our modern society. But more importantly, they think it's going to continue to add value. So for example, I remember I was at a real estate conference 
gosh, it's been six or eight years ago. It's been a while. And people were on stage saying you should be buying Bitcoin immediately because it was at like $8,000. I'm like, why would I spend $8,000 on this theoretical coin? Well, I'll tell you right now, I wish I would have bought a couple of those because I'd be in a lot better spot. And, and so what there are is there are people that are banking that that value is going to go up. So let's say I sell you my house. It's worth, I'm just going to make up a number, $500,000 right now for Bitcoin, which is at 50,000. So basically 10,000 or 10 Bitcoin. What I'm hoping is that in five years, that Bitcoin is now worth $100,000 per coin. And now I just sold that $500,000 house for a million dollars in Bitcoin. So there's some speculation on that part too. And I do think the more it gets regulated, and I'm going to let Matt jump in because I get long-winded. Um, one of the big things I, I was reading and I actually heard in a podcast is the more regulation you get, the more stability you're going to have in these coins. So in the future, they may not be fluctuating 15% in a day. It might be something where, where the fluctuations still happen like stocks and things, but kind of like a, an S&P mutual fund or something like that you're not going to have, you know, 30%, 40% over a month. Like it just won't happen because there, there won't be the same sort of volatility. But Matt, I'd love to hear your answer also. Sure. So that's, uh, that was a great answer to, to add to it is that is, I get that is an issue. The, the volatility and how we, not how we, the title company, but how the parties to the transaction um, allocate the risk for those changing values becomes very important. And that's really between, that's between the parties. So from a title and escrow standpoint, you know, I, I don't care who bears the risk if, if it changes in, in value and somebody has to bring extra money to the table or, or what have you, that's, that's not necessarily our concern, but it does become our concern when we, as the closing agent, we have to make um, various tax and governmental uh, reports um, and have responsibility to report to the IRS and to the government what the value of that transaction is. And so it becomes, and, it, and that valuation has to be within reason. And so um, it makes it difficult when these, the, uh, again, the cryptocurrencies are fluctuating in, in price. But I, I guess the bottom line is, we have this kind of uh, freedom of contract or, um, you know, uh, the, this capitalistic type of, of market where if, if Aaron wants to sell me his um, million dollar home and is willing to sell me his million dollar home for um, my herd of cattle, there's nothing that stops me or Aaron and I for giving him my herd of cattle that we've deemed to be valued at a million dollars um, to him for exchange in that, in that property. That's still a taxable event. And so we have to figure out how to report that exchange or that sale to the IRS. And that is where it becomes difficult. So we really are looking for the IRS as to how to address um, that piece. And then just the last kind of bit on that, on a, on the title side is that when we charge a premium under, or when we issue an owner's policy or a loan policy, we have to do that on the fair market value of the property in US dollars. So um, we can't you know, charge a policy or state that the value of the property is worth a herd of cattle or five Bitcoin. We have to put that in US dollars and we have to charge our premium based on that on that fair market value in US dollars. And so it, again, it comes down to, again, the, the privity of contract and the freedom of contract between those parties to set those values. Um, and if, if we can get that and the parties agree on those terms, in theory, we would be able to handle that transaction um, so long as all of the terms were agreed upon there is the, the volatility of the, of the crypto was accounted for and who's to bear what at closing. If that's all in place and escrow has the appropriate instructions, in theory, we could, um, we could close that. Uh, again, if we were able to handle, um, assuming we were, had the ability to actually hold the crypto and, and transfer and whatnot. So one last thing, and then we'll, we'll jump off and be respectful of time. Um, so there were a couple of good statements in there. Uh, one is, at least for the short term, it probably 
we will, and Matt really kind of dove in on this. First of all, yes, both parties are going to have to agree that that's what the compensation is. So they're going to be, yep, I want Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever it is. And there actually was a, a house that sold in Florida. We can get you the uh, get you the article that talks about it a little bit. But for a while, it probably is going to be some sort of a crypto plus cash kind of situation to, to take care of all of the encumbrances, to take care of taxes, fees. There will be some conversion for, for IRS. And then the uh, and then the last one, uh, the last question, and, and Matt, I'll, I'll do this and then we'll jump off. I had to come up twice. Have you heard of anybody having the IRS come after them or reporting issues based on this? So I have not personally heard of the IRS going after anyone individually for failure to make, you know, for failure to report their crypto transaction. However, I have, so I have not personally heard of anyone. However, I have read a number of reports, for example, the, that kind of all assuming subpoena to the, uh, to Coinbase, that exchange, that's exactly what the IRS is doing. They feel that people are not reporting their exchanges in, in crypto. And anytime there's an accession of wealth, so just to take this a step further, Aaron mentioned to you, we have these miners. When they mine those coins and they get a fee for you know, proofing the that ledger or that transaction and they're compensated in a, in a Bitcoin or whatever it is, that's also a taxable transaction. That is an accession to wealth. You came into to money that you did not have before and that is to be reported to the IRS. And so those are all things that the IRS is, is looking at and they are aware that not everybody's reporting. And because of the not secrecy, but because everybody's associated to these just unique identifying numbers, it's harder for the IRS to figure out who's associated with what account. And that's what they're going through right now to make sure that it's being properly reported. Cool. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for your time. We really do appreciate it. Clearly, this is a, it's a fluid situation. Um, you know, it's going to continue to evolve over the the years, you know, but right now, I think the, the overarching kind of thought process on it is that, you know, treat it like you would any other investment. You know, it's going to be something that for now will probably have to be sold. Um, it will turn into cash and, and it just kind of depends on what your, uh, what your clients want to do. So you have to do your best as a fiduciary to, uh, you know, get them the right people to, uh, to give them honest feedback on what they should be doing. And Sometimes they're just going to do what they're going to do. Thanks, guys. Okay, please, everyone, after the class, watch for your credit certificate come through email. And thanks, Matt, and thanks, Aaron, very much. Our pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Good afternoon. Thanks, Thank everyone. you. Bye.